Wildfire sure is a hot topic these days, pun intended. I'm currently in BC under a haze of smoke from nearby wildfires, and the province has recently declared a state of emergency, which gives us a lot to talk about regarding forest fire these days, especially in the wake of climate change. So let's break it down. Fire is a naturally occurring event in many forest ecosystems, and believe it or not, we actually used to have a lot more fire in the landscape than we currently do today, yet there were a few key differences between those historical fires and those that we see burning out of control and threatening communities all over. See, wildfires are often classified as either low intensity or high intensity burns. Now, low intensity fires burn primarily through the understory or the brush of a forest, which provides many benefits to the ecosystem as a whole, such as returning nutrients to the soil as ash and reducing competition and obstructions on the forest floor so that young tree saplings have an opportunity to get light and grow. Since healthy, mature forest ecosystems host a diversity of tree species at different ages, there are more older fire-resistant trees that can withstand these low-intensity fires, and many forest ecosystems have actually evolved in tandem with these low-intensity fires. For example, Douglas fir hemlock forests in central Cascadia rely on these frequent low-intensity fires to clear the underbrush and allow opportunities for new Douglas fir trees to grow. And without that disturbance, those older Douglas firs would eventually you know, slowly die out and the forest would mature into a late successional stand dominated by western hemlock. Fire has also been used by indigenous people since time immemorial here in Cascadia in environments such as oak woodlands, which surround the Salish Sea, where frequent human-created low-intensity fires helped clear the grasses and underbrush that allowed for Oregon white oak trees to thrive without being overtaken by the surrounding conifers. So these low intensity fires are estimated to happen naturally throughout forest ecosystems in the West every 50 to 100, sometimes 250 or 500 years, depending on the specific ecosystem and its climate, which can all vary greatly. Then on the other hand, you have high intensity fires which occur naturally as a result of compounding factors which makes forests extremely vulnerable, such as long-term drought or disease affecting a forest, and these fires look much different from low intensity fires. They're often known as stand replacing fires because they tend to burn literally everything in the forest from young trees to old, replacing the entire stand because they burn with such high heat, intensity, and vigor that nothing can escape them. Naturally, these types of fires are estimated to occur every 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 years, again, depending heavily on the region and location of the specific ecosystem. In some places, like up north in the Boreal Forest, these types of fires are more common, playing a large role in forest succession up there, and in some areas, they've never occurred ever, like directly on the wet west coast of Cascadia. Now, there are many, many nuances to each biogeoclimatic zone and forest type and fire regime, far too many for me to go in depth on each, but overall, as a result of the way these different forest ecosystems have evolved, mature climax forests, whether they be dominated by old Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, western red cedar, or really any other variety across the west, are naturally resistant to wildfires that we've been witnessing for a variety of different reasons. Out towards the coast, these rich, diverse forest ecosystems hold a ton of water in the soils, the mosses, the variety of understory that keeps them damp or cooler, and thus less prone to massive fires. Further towards the interior, frequent small-scale fires historically have kept more spacing between the different pine, spruces, and junipers that exist there, and the biggest, oldest trees lack lower branches that prevent those small brush fires from spreading into their canopy and then escalating into a crown fire. Up north, in the Boreal Forest, long winters and colder temperatures means that the frequency of fires is very low, but when conditions are right and they do occur, the fuel load up there tends to have fires that burn whole forests over large swaths of land. With colonization and western settlement over the past couple hundred years, a few things have occurred which alters the fire regimes in these different forests. Firstly, Fire has a habit of destroying buildings and infrastructure, so active fire suppression of all kinds to prevent that from happening has allowed for many of these forests that would have naturally been thinned out by low-intensity fires to grow very tight and dense with heavy fuel loads so that when fire does come through, it burns much faster, hotter, and widespread than it would historically on those same lands. The second thing is wide-scale land alterations through logging that have replaced many of these diverse, resilient, mature old-growth forests with monocultures of trees planted at the same age, which creates a really tight, dense canopy with lots of ladder fuels that again allows fire to climb up them quickly and spread throughout the canopy. Now these tight second growth forests are a natural part of stand regeneration following a disturbance, but when this happens naturally, it's often in isolated pockets that have time to mature and thin out over several hundred years, interspersed between different mixed age stands across the landscape. But a majority of our logging has occurred in just the last 60 years across the continent, meaning that that mosaic of diversity has been replaced with an overwhelming amount of young forest that is at higher risk of large high intensity fires. So, 
A common justification for current forestry methods is that the practices we're using to cut and replant trees replicates natural disturbances such as landslides and fires, which cosmetically appears to be correct. You know, often when these forests are cleared, at least here in Cascadia, they're replanted with successional species like Douglas fir or red cedar on the coast, or uh, spruces or pines more interior that do well in really sunny open environments and are usually the first species to occupy areas of disturbance that occur naturally in those ecosystems. Yet there is a crucial difference between these methods and the natural fire regimes they aim to replicate. See, wildfires typically burn through the fine fuels of a forest, the branches, the sticks, the twigs, which all ignite really easy and leave behind the more mature fire-resistant stems of whole trees. Clear cutting, however, removes the stems of those whole trees and instead leaves behind all those fine fuels such as branches and twigs, which are often assembled into slash piles, which are then typically burned. So while to us, the public, these practices look as though they replicate high intensity fires by removing all the trees, which is how they're justified, they actually leave behind more fine fuels on the ground that ignite easier. These quote, fire replicated disturbance logging practices are troublesome because they remove the mature fire resistant trees and leave the fine fuels behind, which are then replanted into those tight monoculture plantation forests I mentioned earlier, instead of removing the fine fuels and leaving the most mature trees as a healthy low intensity fire would. And all of this brings up some serious big picture issues relative to both volume and frequency. Now, there's some discrepancy in reporting here, uh, mostly around the term old growth and how it's defined, but varying sources suggest that at this point, between 90 to 96% of the original forests across the United States have been logged or modified industrial by human activity, and between about 75 to 90% of Canada's original forests, with much of what remains being up in the northern boreal forest or in isolated pockets of mature old growth forests in BC. So, for the sake of this discussion, we'll average that down to say, 85% of forests all across the whole of North America have been cut down in a manner that aims to replicate high intensity fires. Speaking to volume, that is an absolutely ridiculously huge percentage of forested lands all across the continent that have been lost, and the forests that we replace them with are often tightly packed, even aged monoculture stands of trees, meaning that they're more at risk to natural disturbances like the very fires we're trying to replicate. And when combined with the impacts of anthropogenic climate change, such as drought and disease that leaves healthy trees dead or vulnerable, that means that those rare high intensity fires are happening much more frequently and on massive scales, like the ones we're currently experiencing, which seem to only get worse and worse each year. Okay, now the second big problem here is frequency. You see, these virgin forest ecosystems can be thousands of years old, maturing in hundreds if not thousands of years, yet we replace them with trees that we cut down on 70-year crop rotations. And many of the forests on the East Coast are now in their third or fourth generation of harvest. So, through our actions, we've created a situation where within the last 400 years, and especially the last 100 years, over 85% of the continent's original forest ecosystems have been destroyed to the equivalent of being burnt to the ground in a high intensity fire in some places four times over, which statistically only ever occurs every 1,000 to 2,000 years, if at all, yet we're calling all of this totally natural and sustainable. The horrible fires we see every summer burns on average less than 0.008% of all the forest on the continent. Can you imagine if we lived in a world where 85% of the continent burned to the ground in just a couple hundred years? I mean, if you ask me, that doesn't quite sound ecologically sustainable or responsible. It sounds more like the apocalypse. So the problem we face here is multifaceted and so are the solutions. First off, instead of trying to replicate these high intensity burns in our logging practices, we need to allow our forest ecosystems to mature in a much healthier manner over a much longer period of time. And we need to spend a lot of energy and resources properly thinning and restoring the ecological function of the billions of hectares that we've mismanaged up to this point in order to reduce wildfire risk. We need to stop all forms of clear-cut logging, especially that in mature old growth forests, and instead manage our forests for ecological function through close canopy logging based on ecoforestry values that increase biodiversity, ecological complexity, and thus resilience. Secondly, we need to restore the presence of small-scale, low-intensity fires on these landscapes to reduce overstocking of fuel loads by using prescribed fire, ideally managed by local indigenous nations who have the traditional ancestral knowledge of these practices and who have stewarded these lands since time immemorial. By replicating low intensity burns through closed canopy harvest and using prescribed fires, we can not only create a more humble, sustainable industry while also creating a new realm of jobs to support our mix of communities, but we can improve the ecological health and functions of the landscapes we live amongst in this uncertain time. And then zooming out to look at the big picture, we need to recognize that the world we live in is in a constant state of change, exacerbated by the burning of fossil fuels, which has led to the anthropogenic climate change that we're currently experiencing, whose impacts result in heat waves, droughts, and strong storm systems that increase the likelihood of fires like these, in addition to all sorts of other threats. 
We need to radically transform the society we live in to address all of these issues from not only forest management, but away from fossil fuel consumption and greenwash solutions like carbon capture or just myopically planting trees, to instead focus on real solutions that create a better, healthier, and safer world for all of us who live here and the generations that will follow. Thank you.